Thank you. Is our now a particular See ya. For, oh, thank you. I, I'm, I'm gonna, I won't need a seat. But that, no, because I'll take Michael's. Right. <laughs> no, I didn't realize that. <laughs> and there won't be any pressure for time because, you know, an hour. Yeah, we'll but, finish in one hour. But you don't have, you know, if you go a little over, it's.
apologize for the lack of uh, adequate seating. For you. As, as most of you know, we're in the middle of exam period here at UCSB, and the uh, examinations have taken a, a little larger lecture room. So we do apologize, and we appreciate your willingness to catch as you can. And on behalf of our Center for Energy Efficient Materials, a new Energy Frontier Research Center sponsored by the Department of Energy and by UCSB. And on behalf of the Institute for Collaborative Biotechnologies, it's a great privilege and a pleasure for us to welcome our very distinguished seminar visitor, Professor Michael Gretzel. Michael, it's also, it's also a pleasure. It's also a pleasure for many of us to welcome a friend and a, most appropriately highly honored a visitor back to UCSD. Michael has been with us before. He's a professor at the Ecole Polytechnique in Lausanne, Switzerland, where he's the director of the Laboratory of Photonics and Interfaces. As many of you know, Michael's pioneered research on the energy and electron transfer in mesoscopic materials and their optoelectronic applications. He also discovered uh, a new type of solar cell based on dye-sensitized mesoscopic oxide particles, as you well know, and he's pioneered the use of nanomaterials in lithium-ion batteries. Michael is the author of over 500 scientific publications, two books, and the inventor of over 40 patents. He is cited in more than 60,000 citations for his scientific publications, and as such, he's one of the world's 10 most highly cited chemists. He's won numerous awards, including the Millennium European Innovation Prize in 2000, the Faraday Medal of the British Royal Society, the Avinga Award from Holland, uh, the Atalgas Prize, two McKenzie Venture Awards, and uh, the Gerisher Prize. I think you're also receiving an award from the ACS in a couple of uh, days. And uh, he was awarded the uh, Balzan Prize for the Science of New Materials um, uh, as well. Michael's seminar is entitled Molecular Photovoltaics and Mesoscopic Solar Cells Without further ado, Michael, it's a great privilege and a pleasure to have you back with us at Santa Barbara. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. It's good to be back, and uh, Thank thanks to all of you for coming to this uh, lecture. So uh, this afternoon, I will be uh, talking about our work uh, in the area of mesoscopic solar cells. And actually, this picture tells you quite a bit of the whole story. You see, one of those solar cells, it's actually a, a, a cell that is in a glass embodiment. And uh, it does drive a fan. You can see that fan turning. That's, that, that power comes from the cell working in diffuse light illumination. And there are some specific features about this device. You, first of all, the photoactive material is, is printed. It's uh, just between the two glass plates. So how do we get the current out? Glass doesn't conduct. Well, there's a TCO layer on this glass that you know, allows you to collect the current. And we have uh, the photo uh, generating um, uh, titania, the sensitized titania particles that are screen printed on the front glass plate. You, you can print any uh, mode of this particular one here is, uh, is a logo of our school, EPFL. So I'm a pl I please our president when I show that <laughs> everywhere I travel. <laughs> and you see also the green branch here. This reminds you that this solar cell is actually the only one that um, uses a molecular system to generate charges. And it's, it's, so it, uh, it's also the only one that that mimics photosynthesis. 
in the sense that it separates the charge generation step from the conduction of carriers. As you know, in semiconducting PN junction, the, two, the semiconductor does both. It absorbs light, it generates charge, but it also has to conduct the current. And so as a result, silicon cells, for example, have to be uh, very, very pure. They, uh, the typical solar grade silicon is 99.9999% pure. And for good reason, because you get the minority carriers generated. They have to make it to the junction to get collected, be separated, the electron hole pair. So we don't have any minority carriers uh, involved in this conversion device. I'll show you later some more details. Finally, this uh, then told me I have, I have unlimited time, so you might, you might still sit here at midnight. <laughs> I take it that long for every slide. Uh, so uh, f finally, uh, we, uh, we have a bifacial uh, uh, cell. In other words, that cell collects light from all angles, uh, from the front, from the back. And we have shown in a recent Nature Photonic material paper that was published together with Professor Seiko Ito that uh, the efficiencies from both sides can be very close, within 5% the same. And so, uh, well, this is where the uh, cell work is carried out at the Ecole Polytechnique in Lausanne, the Lake Geneva, or Lac Léman, as the, the local people say, and uh, the Alps in the background. So, nice setting. Just want to acknowledge my co-workers. I'll be more specific as the talk goes along. The funding, we like to uh, first of all, acknowledge funding from our Swiss uh, sources. I'm also being funded by the US Air Force and the European Jewel Projects, very, very important. Uh, the, uh, this is our lifeline. <laughs> and so uh, also recently I was able to get an advanced research grant from the European Research Council. I've just come back from Korea on this trip. Uh, actually, I was in Seoul yesterday. We're having a GRL project with the with Korea Stanford. We have a KAUST, uh, uh, with one of the KAUST uh, uh, Center for Advanced Molecular Photovoltaics. Uh, we are one of the members of the center. And finally, we have the uh, industrial partners. So the outline, very, very briefly, it will be an introduction. Then we uh, talked to you about recent advances, our research, mainly unpublished work. And then where well, we will scale up in industrial applications. So the challenge is, I think you, on, you know, the challenge is the 14 terawatt gap you have to cover by year 2050. It's just based on the projections, world population growing, consumption growing due to mainly the population growth. And so, so that gap has to be covered. But fossilized sources will be will not be able to cover that since we have that cap on the CO2. And so no, renewable is, uh, is a must. So the renewable sources, not only photovoltaics, it's wind, biomass, uh, geothermal, tidal, and so on. But cost is an issue. And so this, uh, this uh, photovoltaics have been doing very well, growing, growing up to Last year, when we reached about 8 gigawatts, that was the annual installation of peak power. So be very careful. That means that this, the power that will be delivered from those installations, if they are exposed to full sun. But not, that's not happening all the time. So we have a dilution factor. And so that factor depends where you have your cells. Good average is five down, so this eight is really not eight. It's below two gigawatts on average. Uh, and so just think about it. We need 14 terawatts. So for the fact of 10,000 missing in the equation, and that's a challenge we have. And we've got about 40 years to get those. Uh, so the prediction as photovoltaic will not be able to cover this fact of 10,000, uh, perhaps of optimists say perhaps one-fourth of it. 
And so let's just do everything we can to you know, make a contribution. And our work has to be viewed in this context. But uh, I should also say that this growth has been fueled mainly by subsidies. Uh, I have mentioned subsidized PV market. And uh, last year, there was, you would think, well, has there been a, a, a growth of 30%? No. Actually, there was a setback last year. And so people don't show their column, <laughs> but it's lower. <laughs> and so, uh, so why? Well, the, uh, the uh, Spanish government uh, decided to cut back on the subsidies. <coughs> and the, the Spanish government running out of money. As you know, we have money crunch in several countries in Europe. And these tend to be the southern countries, Greece, Spain, Portugal. And so this, uh, Italy, so this cutback on the Spanish subsidies produced a major uh, setback. And we got back to maybe seven last year. So the uh, goal is uh, to, uh, to bring in technologies that perhaps uh, are more competitive on the, on the price level than the current generation of silicon cells. Current generation of silicon cells uh, have a large embodied energy. They need about 3.5 years to get the energy back. And the, uh, the uh, so energy, very, very energy intensive. I mentioned the purity. All of this uh, makes it a technology that, according to some analysis, cannot make it to the tower scale, really. Because you need so many terawatts to make those terawatt silicon panels <laughs> that uh, you're running out of juice simply. And so the, the silicon panels you make are not producing the energy to fuel the growth. Payback time is too long. And so we need to have some disruptive breakthroughs and uh, to, uh, for PV to become the unsubsidized market. And so the... Uh, the cost reduction is, uh, of course, very important. And they, they put the SIP processing upscaling. I mean, these are evident uh, factors that everybody tries to achieve. Some people have uh, also illusions about the uh, feedstock availability. Just think about catalloride. Well, catalloride is tellurium. And tellurium is as well as gold. But can you make it to the terabyte scale with catalloride? No. It's you can maybe 100 gigawatts, and then you finish with all the tellurium that is on Earth. And so, so there are severe limitations on some of the materials. Six is another, another material that is very limited due to indium. And so, again, coming back to, so, so, so we have to be very careful about what materials you use, the environmental impact, availability. At the end, what matters is can you compete with the conventional wholesale price? So what would that mean? Well, you could have to bring down <coughs> the electricity price. Well, that's actually power, peak power, to 50 uh, cents, US cents a peak watt. What does that mean? I mean, a device that makes one watt in full sunshine should cost 50 US cents. It's a very simple equation. So how much would that, that device give you back in terms of kilowatt hours price? What's the kilowatt hour price? If you have a module, this peak watt price for the module, well, just divide it by 10. It's very simple. 50 cents goes down to 5 cents per kilowatt hour. That's an average. Depends where you put the cell up. But a factor of 10 is a good factor to use. And so we, if you get to 5, uh, cents per kilowatt hour, then you are competitive with other sources, and, and that's what you want to be. To make this market less sensitive to, to the subsidies, at the moment, uh, it's very, very sensitive to subsidies. And so we have uh, advantages with regards to the license size technology. The, uh, one big advantage is uh, we can use uh, 
readily available materials. Production costs are low. I just attended a conference in, uh, in Tokyo, the PV, it's called PV Expo, the third one, the biggest PV exhibition in the world. I gave a, a presentation there and about the Fujikura Corporation working on Dyson's high cell presented their cost analysis and they came up with 40 yen per pequot as a realistic target. So remember I said 50 cents? Well, 40 yen is very close to 50 US cents. So, so we need, but we, you know, that we are not there yet. I mean, this is a projected target, but based on a realistic uh, experience in production, I'll show you later the some of the results that Fujikura has with module production and efficiency and stability. So the Dyson style cell that uses these mesoscopic titanium films to support a monolayer, a self-assembled monolayer of sensitizer. I've drawn here the ruthenium complex that is called N3, named after Dr. Nasserudin in our laboratory. And so this is bound to the titanium surface ions by this coordinative uh, interaction of carboxylates with the uh, surface titanium ions. And so, so that makes a very strong bond. You like to have that. Uh, one of the problems in long-term operation is not to lose your dye. If you lose it from the surface, by whatever reason, for whatever reason, it might not produce any more electric power. So you don't want that to happen, so you need to attach the dye firmly to the surface so that it can also sustain the severe tests that are being carried out with photovoltaic modules. I'll show you later the three key tests. One is the 85-85. It means 85 degree cent centigrade at 85% humidity for 1,000 hours. You maintain the module for six weeks in 85 degree relative humidity at 85 degrees. One test, the first. Once you pass this, you take same module and illuminate for 1,000 hours at 60 degrees. Then you do the temperature cycling from minus 40 to 90 for 200 times, and then you should have less than 5% loss in efficiency. It's, it's tough. <laughs> so if you have something flimsy there, it will be uncovered, okay? And so, um, so the, uh, the stability has to be high. And, uh, I mentioned the low-cost processing. This, by the way, is uh, from our Spanish colleague. This, yeah. Southern Europeans have really this nice aesthetic uh, taste. You see the flower behind, it just shows the transparency of the cell again. <laughs> well, so the first publication was published uh, uh, in 91, and it showed, this picture shows the, the uh, the uh, principle, again, we have the nanocrystals. Today, there's other shapes. The first paper was on, we called them at that time, colloidal titanium particles. Today, they're called nanocrystals. And so the, the nanocrystals are printed on this glass, and they are sintered together by short thermal uh, exposure. And then you dip the film and dye solution within a couple of minutes, you have the dye as monolayer on the surface. It's a self-limiting process. Well, the ones you have uh, covered, saturated all the coordination sites on the surface, the dye doesn't go on anymore. It's a self-limiting, self-assembly of molecules, self-limiting. And so once the dye gets excited, it will eject an electron in the uh, conduction band of the oxide. So titanium is a mundane material that's used in toothpaste and medical pills. When you take a pill, you swallow a pill, probably eat some titanium every day. And so it's a harmless material, but it's also a semiconductor. It's wide band of semiconductor. And we're using the, uh, the conduction band of that semiconductor as an electron conductor. And so once the electron is injected in the conduction band, it travels down has to travel down several hundred particles to make it to the collector. And I should mention to you, there's no electric field that helps us in a charge separation. What helps you is that the, the titanium itself has a high dielectric constant, 
higher than organic materials. And so the charge separation is facilitated by the uh, dialectic concept, also by the inner layer, by the interface itself. I'll get back to that. You can engineer interface so that the recombination reaction is slowed down. Now, the recombination reaction happens between electrons that travel down the particle film, so this network of nanoparticles. Electrons will be percolating, moving down this network. Positive charge has to be picked up by a cold conductor or an electrolytic redox system. And so the holes of positive charge going down into porous space. This is very important to understand that in this system, the electrons go down one phase and the positive charge is another phase. They're not in the same material. And those two materials that act as electron or hole conductor, they're separated by the phase boundary, which is a three-dimensional junction. So this cell is the first bulk hetero junction in a way. It's a three-dimensional junction, and, uh, and it uses the, uh, the uh, huge interface to uh, collect charges, but not only. We need those small particles to uh, also for two other reasons. One is the, the particles are not doped. So you want the first electron that is injected in a particle has to make it conductive. And with nanoparticles, you can do that. It's not the TI2 nanoparticles insulator. You put the one electron in, the doping level goes up to 10 to the 18 per cubic centimeter. So it becomes a, a well-doped semiconductor just by putting one charge in this nanoparticle. Now, under full light illumination, we have about 15 electrons per particle. So the particle becomes very conductive. No problem about the uh, uh, charge collection that uh, depends, of course, on uh, the resistance of the, of the particle layer. So what we avoid about is the transport resistance. What's the resistance for the charge being collected through that particle network? And the recombination resistance. That's the resistance for the electrons going back out and recombining with the holes. And so what you want is that the transport resistance is much lower than the recombination resistance. And so if you have a factor of 10 between the two, you're, so you're safe. You're collecting your carriers. So there are several configurations that we are, we are in, being examined. We have electrolyte cells. We have the, that's the classical one was iodide organic solvent. Today, a lot of configurations use actually ionic liquids. The first uh, commercial cells use ionic liquids, no more solvents. Uh, redox couples and redox couples instead of iodide are being introduced. And we have the solid state sensors heterojunction, where we use organic coal conductors or solid polymer electrolytes or inorganic coal conductors. And then the last embodiment are quantum dot absorber cells. So, so we don't use a dye anymore. We go to the quantum dots. Well, why would you do that? Well, so far it has been fairly difficult to get the wavelength response of that system above 900 nanometers. And so even 900 is a challenge. A couple of dyes that will do it. And so. So we're looking for a near-infrared response, especially when it comes to tandem systems. We want one, if you take a double layer tandem, you want one, one absorber, the, the bottom cell to be at 0.9 EV, so up to 1,300 nanometers. And the top, you want to be at 1.7. And so that should absorb up 750 down. And so the, the, the top layer, no problem. But we're working on the bottom layer cells, and you'll see in a minute what, that's where the quantum dots come in. They, they are easily fashioned to absorb in the near infrared. So let's just take a breath and look at this slide again. It shows you just the transparency of the, uh, of the uh, cell. So uh, this, this is one of the unique selling arguments we have. You know, we're always forced with, the, uh, with competition of many photovoltaic technologies. But what's so unique about Dyson's test cells? 
Well, one thing that's unique is that no other photovoltaic technology can make uh, truly transparent uh, films. It's not only that we can make transparent. You might say, well, it's not really transparent. It's colored. Yes, it's colored, but it's not scattering the light. If you can even make it uncolored, so how would you do that? Well, you just use a near infrared eye. And then you have the visible part of the light go through. Now, what kind of efficiency could you get? 6% easily, because we can collect between 7 and 900 nanometers, but 14 milliamps per square centimeter current from the sun. And so it's, uh, it's not a bad cell. It, uh, it's, uh, it's something attractive for building facade applications, which I will get back later. This slide is uh, from uh, Copenhagen. So this morning I, I talked to one of Dan's postdocs. Uh, from Copenhagen, he will recognize the water here. People jogging around this artificial lake in the middle of the city. So this is a commercial uh, module, and it's, uh, it shows you, it's a, it's a truth, it's a working module uh, and uh, producing electric power it's a, to uh, look through device. Now, going back, a few more minutes to the fundamentals. So we have this dimonal layer, and uh, it's generating charges. It's injecting electrons in the oxide, injecting holes in the electrolyte of the whole conduct. So this is our light absorber and charge generating entity, the dye or the, the quantum dot. And that's why we can separate. We, we separate the uh, function of transport from light absorption carrier generation. But if you take a flat monolayer of dye, the, the light will go right through. Typical cross section for light absorption for these dyes are a few hundred times smaller than the, uh, the uh, geometric cross section. So optical cross section much smaller than the geometric cross section. The dye occupies geometric cross section. You need hundreds of dye molecules on top of each other to get the light absorbed. Here we have only one dimer layer. So you need to have those nanoparticles. The nanoparticles uh, give you a very large surface enhancement, typically a factor of 1,500 for 10 micron thick film of this. Uh, it's about 20 nanometer sized uh, particles here. And so just think about it. This film is, uh, is at the Arteria Anatase. We have put the dimer layer on. Now light comes in, hits the first particle, it sees about two monolayers of dye, comes the next, goes through many, many monolayers of dye, and finally it gets attenuated. It's like the, the green leaf. Why is the leaf green and not white? Chlorophyll is also a, 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 a dye molecule. In the membrane, it's a monolayer. Well, you have these membranes stacked on top of each other, like we have nanoparticles stacked, and that gives you the light harvesting. But there are more advanced uh, structures. I should mention that a lot of research is going on on new method structures. And this is something very exciting that, uh, that uh, comes from an Australian group. Dr. Uh, Dr. Rachel Caruso from the uh, University of Melbourne and Yibing Cheng. They uh, disclosed in a conference that I attended last year in Wuhan, China in August. Uh, this, uh, this, uh, these tennis balls, they look like, like moth balls, but they're mesopause. So, and they're easily produced. That's the, the, that's the charm of it. It's the charm of using a surfactant, I think, the uh, templating agent. And it's really a simple reaction. It's published, I have given the last one. So when I heard Yibing's talk in, uh, in uh, Wuhan, terribly hot day in Wuhan, China, they're all being grilled, but I was so inflamed by this lecture. So I said to Yibing, I want your balls. I want to test them. <laughs> 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 and so, uh, so he said, well, 
how about giving me some of your dye? I said, no problem. Make a deal, shake hands. And so that's how we start collaborating. And so we have, from a, we have been able to get, oh, 11% just from a layer of those, those uh, mesoscopic beads. And now, to, to, to tell you what is so exciting is, it, so these beads have a 20, 23 nanometer size channel. The BUT has been done. We have seen a meso pore from the, uh, from the uh, isotherm. So it's all solid. Just believe me. I won't, get, uh, an, uh, I won't uh, um, bore you with details. So they are mesoporous. And they have about a surface area of 90 square meter per gram. So when you put the dye on, the dye will infiltrate these particles fully. So they become tainted particles. Red, green, whatever you, you, you put as sensitizer. And now the exciting thing is when you excite those uh, the dye, the charge separation can collect all the carriers you generate in those balls. They all make it out from inside. Not only that, they are better than the nanoparticle arrays. Why? Well, two reasons. One is they are being centered at higher temperatures so that the connectivity between those particles you see here, these are individual particles, is better than our nanocrystalline films, which uh, can only be heated up to 550. Why? Well, the glass. So you have conducting glass, you have to be limited in temperature. You could heat those up to any, anything you want. I mean, you lose surface area if you go too high. But, but uh, so they are better. We have checked that we're doing impedance spectroscopy. We know the transport is better. Transport of electrons across these particles is faster than in our films. And in addition, these particles have a light scatter function. So what happens to the light, it, gets, it hits a particle. It gets laterally deflected. And so the optical path gets longer. This is very, very important in photovoltaics. You have to do your utmost to do the optical light management. If you don't do that, you are a loser right away. Because other competing technologies use all the tricks that are available for, to do the light management correctly. And so here's something that does the light management for you. It does the light scatter. It does a better, a better carrier transport. Well, you might say, well, but how about particles moving from this speed to the next? Well, that's your problem. You have to make sure that you have some very small particles that will do the sintering connection, like 5 nanometer Ti2, that sinter the, make a bridge during the sinter process. And so, uh, so I got very, very excited. And as, I sp as we speak here, as I speak, Fuji. Fuzi, the Chinese postdoc of Rachel Koruta, Yibing Cheng. He's in my lab. <laughs> so I made sure that we get all our forces together to push this, to get new record efficiencies out of the, the advantage we have with these mesoporous beats. So it's just titanium. This is good old titanium, very boring material for ceramicists. But you get those beautiful beads, and they produce electric currents at, at the external quantum efficiency or internal quantum efficiency of close to 100%. That's it. That's the naked truth. And so let's just try to get de-excited for a moment and go back to the <laughs> kind of all, all uh, excited about these micro beads. And so, so uh, you excite the sensitizer. This is just a scheme one for more for last time. The, the, the charge separation happens by injection. It's an interfacial reaction. So electron is in the, in the oxide, and positive charge is sitting on the sensitizer. Now, of course, you might think this, this charge can recombine. Yes, they do. They do recombine. You know, it takes about a millisecond a few milliseconds, depending on sensitizer, can get 100 milliseconds. But much faster than that is the regeneration step. That's a microsecond reaction. So we're making sure that 
the positive charge is moved out from the surface away to the whole conductor. And so then you have another recombination. These electrons are injected with the oxidized whole conductor, oxidized electrolyte. Well, that's much slower. That's, that's something that is slowed by, down by the sensitizer itself. The sensitizer itself is a blocking, electronically blocking in the current state. So if you have a good monolayer, it will retard that back reaction. Can, you can use other tricks. Believe me, the back reaction, that back reaction is much slower so that we get very long lifetimes. And you can build up those charges, building up charges on the, in the uh, whole conductor electrolyte and electrons are building up a voltage across this phase boundary. And that's the VOC, that's the open circuit voltage. And then if you close the circuit, you can draw a current. So that's a photovoltaic converter. And so let's uh, look at the events on the, the time axis, just a summary. We're having the electron injection. There's something that happens in the sub-picosecond range. And we have the diode generation, depending on whether you have a whole conductor or electrolyte. This can go up to microseconds. It's below nanoseconds to microseconds. Then comes this critical part. How fast is the uh, interfacial recombination and how fast the electron transport? Uh, so the, the f a favorable case is shown here. We have two orders of magnitude. Transport is 100 times faster than recombination. Well, no problem. I mean, that means the branching ratio is uh, 1 over 100 by collecting all your carriers. No problem. But that's not always the case. I mean, some is, when I talk about whole conductor cells later, this gets dangerously close. So you, you struggle. You have to measure every time when you change your system and make sure that you're OK with the carrier collection. If you have a system like that, your diffusion length will be way above the film thickness, about 100 micron diffusion length and 10 micron film thickness. There's no problem with collecting the carriers. And so that's good. Let's look at the dyes. Well, here's some uh, examples. I mentioned this red. We have seen a lot of red color that comes from this oxidium dye. Strangely enough, in Japan, people use a lot of the black dye, which is similar, similar concept. It just has a top hood dye with copper oxalates. It goes a little bit further in the, in the IR. We're very excited about this dye. That's a new dye that we have actually, uh, uh, it's not our invention. It's uh, been first described by Dr. Eric Diao from uh, Taiwan. And Eric has been uh, giving a talk. It's uh, very similar to the Wuhan situation. <laughs> I listened to his talk this was in Nara, Nara, Japan, last year. And uh, he had this Boffin dye. And so I was very surprised that he got, he got such good injection because we had been, the triple bond was always an issue whether you can inject through the triple bond. See, this, this is the attaching function. You have phenyl carboxylate. He got about 5% conversion efficiency. But I asked him for a sample. And I know that organic chemists, they, they're not as well trained to make photovoltaic cells as we are. <laughs> we are not as well trained to make organic molecules. I said to him, why don't you give me some of your diet, test it again. So we got over 10%, 11% efficiency the first time with an organic diet, no more ruthenium just based on a donor, the acceptor. And this is the usually pi bridging system is now replaced by a porphyrin. So we, we find it's very exciting to have uh, the uh, now efficiency over 10% with organic dyes that don't use rare metals anymore. And so just uh, one last time before I I you some recent research results that will finish the general section of my lecture. So we have uh, then a difference in the PN junction, which is working fine. It's just that keep in mind when you take PN junction, you have minorities. Excite the p-type, the electrons are minorities. They have to make it to the junction. And so how much time do they have to make it to the junction? Well, a few microseconds. Is that a problem? 
Not really for silicon. If you make it 99.9999% pure, you will get it. You will get the diffusion length of a few hundred nano, uh, microns, and that's about the layer thickness of a silicon photovoltaic cell. But you've got to have those six nines in your purity. Okay. And the same thing on this side. Okay, the holes are the minorities. So, so that's fine. I mean, that side is what I said in the beginning. We have the accumulation of cast. And the PN junction, the absorb light, the transport carriers. Here we don't. We have a molecule that gets excited, generates charges, but it's not involved in the transport. So here's the critical difference between the two systems. So here comes your relaxation after the general <laughs> part of my lecture. Just look at the green leaf for a while, take all the science out of your brain. <laughs> And so, uh, so we're close to uh, natural photosynthesis. Because in natural photosynthesis, also you have a dye, the chlorophyll, chlorophyll molecule absorbing light, generating charges. And uh, the chlorophyll is not involved in uh, the carrier transport. So, so now let's. Uh, since we have a green porphyrin, we're very close, at least in color, to what happened in the green leaf. But also, as I said, principle, very similar to the initial part of natural photosynthesis. We all know there's no electric current coming out of a green leaf. Why? Well, there is a current generated across the membrane, but this, these charges are immediately transformed in redox react reactions, water oxidation, CO2 reduction. We don't see those charges, but they are there. They're flowing all the time. So here's our favorite uh, molecule, the YD2 dye that uh, comes from Eric's group. And uh, so we got this. So this is the IPC, which is external quantum efficiency. So when I showed that in Japan a couple of weeks ago, somebody said, are you really sure you get over 90%? And the reason why we can get such a high EQE is we have anti-reflective layer. And we make sure the class we use is very, very transparent in this. Uh, actually, it so happens as a constructive interference in a conductive glass so that it gets really transparent at, in this particular wavelength range. And has no iron in it, so we can get those very high efficiencies, uh, uh, the EQE being 98%. But we also have a, a hole here. The response is that's why the color is green. So that's not so good. I mean, it looks good to have a green cell, but there's a loss in the photovoltaic reaction transformation. But we can use, uh, I don't want to go into details here, but we can use foster energy transfer to capture this part of the light. and do the down conversion, if you like, uh, of these photons to so red photons that will then uh, be captured as electric cons. So why does the, the signal go down as sharply here? Well, it's just our anti-reflective coating. That's also a UV rejecting uh, uh, optical medium. And so, but at the, the final version, when we test Champion cells, we will not use it. We will use a normal anti reflecting coating that has an uh, uh, optical window in the UV. And uh, so uh, it's just convenience. We have this scotch, it's like scotch tape, we put it on our cells, and it serves as anti reflective coating. So this is now some real leaves that are photovoltaically active. And so what's, what's going on? Well, these are the green green molecules generating powers. And the power is making the butterfly flap the wings. <laughs> it's not the kind of tower work, uh, power conversion we, we are dreaming of, but uh, it's, a nice, uh, it's a nice gadget. So uh, it's actually the Japanese like that. And so I, I'm showing you, I'm showing you that they, they uh, they also make a, a, a Prius go around with this kind of photovoltaic cells, a kind, of, kind of sunflower. And, and believe it or not, this is now being commercialized. It's a, 
seem to have a big <laughs> success. In, uh, so if you want to buy one of those, I can direct you towards the supplier. And so, so this is the, uh, the D donor pi except that I and showed you the, or the new prof one, which is 11%. And uh, it has a nice voltage. It's uh, about 780 millivolts VOC. It has a current of close to 19 milliamps, which is very high for a molecular sensitized system. And so these are measurements are done correctly under AM 1.5 standard. And we go regularly to NREL or the Fraunhofer to have our results confirmed. So what, when you do a photovoltaic measurement, you have to do the IV curve, measure photocurrent, a uh, short circuit, and you put uh, increasing uh, load, this external circuit, and so finally the load is so big that no more current passes, you add VOC. And so the power is zero here, zero at VOC. In between you have maximum power point, and efficiency is just that power at maximum power point by the power in is the 1,000 watt per square meter. That's the standard in your simulator. And so the, the, the standard is also defined as AM 1.5, which is the sun at an angle that corresponds to 1.5, the path length in the atmosphere, 1.5 of this times the vertical path length. So just to make sure we understand, this is all standard. We have carried out at 25 degrees. And we are applying these standard conditions. Now, with regards to the porphyrin, I'd like to just make one remark. We have done some, uh, immediately we thought about how can we shift the spectral response further out of the red. That's the dream of everybody here in this room. Can we capture more of the near infrared? And so, uh, uh, Filippo De Angelis from Verrucia, he has done some calculations on this porphyrin system that I showed you. And you can see here's the donor moiety. That's the homo electron distribution. We have electron density on the donor, very little on this acceptor part, the triple bond. This is the porphyrin system. Now, when we excite the molecule, we see the donor loses. Electrons go, and they're mainly shifted at, to the phenyl groups. And uh, but that's what you want. You, you want actually this to happen. But you should also notice that the LUMA, there's a knot in the wave function at the sites where you have these substituents. That's very, very exciting. I'll tell you why. The, what you want to do is you want to have, you want to move the HOMO up, but you don't want to move the LUMA down when you do substitution. You get perfect interaction. You got 98% uh, of quantum efficiency. You don't want to kettle with the LUMA, bring this down, all of a sudden you lose on your uh, injection. But you have a lot of leeway, too much driving force in the, in the whole injection, regeneration step. And so we like to change that, We're putting a stronger donor in this position. Would that affect the LUMA? No, it wouldn't, because you have a knot in the wave function. So what I'm telling you increasingly at these organic systems, we are, we are using a theoretical chemistry to predict what happens in a modular way. You change one thing on the molecule, so what's going to happen in the spectral response, the homo lumo position, so that we don't have to make these molecules all the time, which is very time consuming. And so uh, the answer here is the following. I'll tell you a secret now. If I use this donor, and we'll see, the, the, this is the theoretical calculation. The theoretical calculation says if I use this donor, which is a trirelamine, remember, structure of this porphyrin, go back. It's this moiety here, glyrelamine. That's the donor. This is our substituent. What I, I mentioned to you is the LUMA is not sensitive to what you do in these positions. Well, if that's the case, I want to put this donor on in all three positions to have a stronger donor function. I want to have this diarylamine here, here. What would that do spectrally? What are the theoreticians coming up with? 60 nanometer shift red. So as we see, as we speak, that molecule is being prepared. And 
we'll know soon whether the theoreticians came up with the right answer. <laughs> It'll be a Lockwood's test for the present. Kind of some modified DFT calculation. A simple DFT you cannot use on donor acceptor system. It's very, very poor, uh, the, the precision. But there are now new models, the new codes and, uh, that you can use. And so that's, we're going to see what happens. So the same thing with the ruthenium dyes. We're extending our chromophores by using thiophenes. So that's just the delocalization is extended. Yeah, and uh, that buys you what? Well, this is our standard. You move, uh, you put the two thiophenes on. Again, I should, I should give credit to Professor Wu, who supplies this compound test. We're collaborating. And so you gain, in, in both in, uh, in uh, optical cross-section, as the exchange curve go up, but also the red response of the dye goes up. So at the end, you, what you see in your IPC spectrum is you, you, you're getting an improved red response. And so the improved red response is bought not only by a redshift, but if you increase the extinction coefficient, you also get a, an advantage. You can use thinner films. You can, so we are, we are very much after this enhancement in the extinction coefficient. In a few nanometer red response is important. So going from 535 to 552 buys you quite a bit of uh, current here. So how is that possible? How come we can go up to 800 nanometers? That's just the tail of the absorption. The tail, you, you, you see we have, to, we have this tail here. Now you might be very critical there and say, well, I, I see nothing here. It's almost brisk. There's no absorption. Well, <laughs> it's true. It's, very, it's small in the solution, but when you put it on the film and you get some shift by high stacking. And, uh, in addition, you, uh, you do this light scatter trick where we enhance the optical path. And so even though the solution spectrum looks very poor, the response optically above 700 nanometers, at 700 nanometers with this particular dye, I get 70% external quantum efficiency. So on the film, things happen that uh, look much better than in solution. Of course, the solution is. The, 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 the height of the signal depends on concentration. So you know, these spectra can be misleading in that sense. So we uh, could crank our concept now to the present champion cells are 12, a little bit over 12%. So that's using the, uh, I should mention, the, the best sensitizer. These are actually thiophenes, but with a thiol in addition, which buys you a little bit more right response and a high extinction coefficient. So these are molecular engineered sen sensitizers. I'm sure we can learn a lot from the OPV. And I'll show you one example in a minute. Uh, the, uh, that's in the sensitized heterojunction. In the sensitized heterojunctions, we have only two micron thickness for reasons of, uh, I won't go into detail, the pore filling is more difficult with these whole conductors. We typically work with film thickness, titanium film thickness of two to three microns. Now the real challenge is, can you, with such a thin film, capture enough light? And for a while we were really struggling to get our external quantum efficiencies up. But comes the advent of these Dyes. Actually, this is all made in China. <laughs> and this is my former postdoc, Peng Wan, who has, he came up with the idea to just, well known, of course, the field of hormones, uh, to link the two thiophenes. If you do that, the extinction coefficient of that dye goes up by a factor of two, a hundred percent. If you compare the well known it's called D21, which has the two thiophenes without this link. The 30,000 extinction coefficient. You put the link on, you get 65,000. So why? Well, it's well known. That this bridge brings the two thiophenes in a planar, coplanar 
or nearly coplanar configuration that helps in the uh, coupling. If you have to couple the donor to the acceptor, these two wave functions have to overlap. Otherwise, you don't get a charge transfer absorption. And so you can see 65,000, now we have no problem to get the EQ above 80%. Even though our film thickness is only 2.5 micron. And so we're hitting now 6.5% in conversion efficiency for the solid state whole conduct cells. The optical response is, is still poor. See, we're starting at 700. So these dyes don't have a, a nice red response yet. I say yet because you can play probably tricks to get a red shift at least up to 700, 100 nanometers. So that's what we are working on. It just to show you how simple detail in the molecular design can change the, uh, the spectral response so much. Yes? Yeah, I should explain to you that the, the molecules that lack this uh, link here, the, the ones that have just two thiophenes. Uh, yeah, I know, but uh, let, let me just explain to you. Those molecules have been widely investigated by the Uppsala group of Professor Hartfield and Li Cheng Tsung from, from, uh, from Dalian. Uh, and we also have worked on them. We have, and we have shown that the uh, the, the solubility is better with a T6. Uh, so the self-assembly is, uh, is, 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 uh, is favored. So at the end, we're getting um, we get actually better performance uh, having those long chains. You might ask also, why do we put chains here? And I don't know. Maybe Alan knows that because that's, we, we steal the idea from the, from the OPV people. That's not our idea to link this. Uh, that's a Konarka patent. And so I asked the Konarka whether they had patented this diet. They said no. <laughs> so, but the polymer is a well-known uh, feature in the polymers. So why is there a long chain? I guess it's just helping you to solubility. And uh, it's uh, in, on the surface, you get better self-assembly. Uh, the diet, the model is perhaps more compact with these alkyl chains. You see very, very much better stability. I should mention to you that one of the concerns we always had with these dyes was, are they stable? And so, uh, so the, from the uh, molecular design, you would say they should be brilliant. They should be very stable. Why am I saying that? Well, at least the hole, once you make a hole, it's going to be located on the trigonomy. And these are very stable cation radicals. You can buy those cation radical salts. They're, they're stable for, for days. I need only about one hour stability in the cation radical, okay? But I get the turnover number for a 20-year lifetime. And so, uh, so this is okay. But, uh, and, and so, uh, so we, are, we were testing those dyes recently. And uh, this is actually a, from Peng Wang's paper. It's out now. It's on the internet. And this is now the highest. This particular dye gave over 10% efficient cells in the liquid electrolyte cells with a volatile solvent. And it gives you 8% stable with an ionic melt electrolyte solvent free system. It's a very simple design. But uh, it's, for me, this uh, rings. <laughs> I think about that we were probably going to see the organic taking over the ruthenium dyes <coughs> very fairly soon. So, so that's uh, certainly going to happen. Now let me talk to you uh, about this also as a solid state cell, but now we're not using a dye. We're using this, this work with, uh, in collaboration with Dr. Sang Il Sok from Craig, and also Gary Hodes from the Weizmann Institute. So what we did there is we just use a antimony sulfide. You see those these red 
uh, of structures here. This, this is presenting the antimony sulfide. The antimony sulfide is the as a, these are thin platelets. They're, they're very close to what is called extremely thin absorber layer cells. They are not contiguously following all the corrugations of the titania, but I have an uh, uh, electromicrograph I will show you in a minute. Uh, so these are the, the TI2 particles that Dr. Thok developed. They're about 100 nanometer size, so they're bigger than our normal particles. They're well-faceted particles. And so these support the antimony sulfide. And now what we did in this case, we just filled the holes with a P3HT. It's a well-known uh, sort of hole conductor in the organism. And uh, that actually this shows you the, uh, there's an annealing step which uh, helps to, to make those uh, thin platelets on the surface. And so, so the antimony sulfide actually there is plating onto the surface of the uh, oxide nanopole. And uh, so, uh, so it got very nice result right away. I mean, external chrome efficiencies over 70%. The reason why they go down here is that the self, it's a filtration effect. Light, light is filtered by the, by the polymer. And uh, the, 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 this is unproductive because the axon diffusion length is shorter than the pore. It's a big pore, it's for the 100 nanometer sized particle. And so, but recently we have your silver, that's a better reflector. So. We actually get, uh, even with this simple configuration, over 5%. And this is just P3HT, no additive. Now, when we use our whole conductor, one I showed you before, the, the spiral omnitide, this is this molecule. We have also made cells with a spiral omnitide. We don't have that exciton generation problem, the fil filter problem, this uncolored the spiral we can get over 80% external quantum efficiency of the whole uh, spectral range. So, so it's very impressive. Looks like antimony sulfide is very effective in, uh, in generating electric charges from visible light with that particular configuration. Also a sensitized system, but sensitized by a semiconductor. And so, uh, so we also have done some stability work with the uh, Koreans, and Koreans already applied for a number of patents, <laughs> submitted papers, so things are going well. <laughs> so this uh, is about 12 milliamps. You see, this is the, this is the uh, verdict at this stage with the P3HT antimony sulfide system. One, uh, one question I had was how come the P3HT is is going in the pores. And to be honest, I, the pores are as big, so that helps probably the infiltration process. And um, there must be the, the interface between the P3HT and the animal sulfide must be uh, energetically favorable so that the polymer gets pulled in by, in by a capillary kind of tight interactions. We also have a new redox mediator. Gosh, I have to rush. So I, take you through this quickly. This, so instead of iodide, we can use now recently, actually a paper came out in Nature Chemistry. And we, make, we have this redox, this uncolored. And uh, it works well. <laughs> the first one, it works well at full sunlight. So we're getting a current of 16 milliamps. It's high for, for we have never had a redox system that would that will work so well with high currents being delivered. What is not so good is this loss. This, uh, the back contact is, uh, is made out of a platinized uh, FTO glass. And it looks like the sulfide is not a good uh, agent to have. When you have platinum and sulfur, it doesn't <laughs> make a good uh, 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 couple. So we need to work on new redox catalysts for the, for the back contact. But it's promising. Finally, before I, I show you some, uh, some of the applications, this is now a, a solar cell. We have talked about the sensitized cells. We have talked about the, 
so the Schottky says this is something Art Nozick is working on, and, and Ted Sargent. Recently, something surprising, if you use those Ti2 particles, and you put just a layer of the nano quantum dots, no whole conduct. Well, <laughs> we could see that they work. So apparently, this, these particles can conduct the whole array, which I, you know, I was very surprised to see that. I, I had it repeat my, my lab several times. I have now engaged a, a, a guy student from Israel who helps me with that. And we submit a paper with with, with uh, Ed Sargent. And so uh, it's called a depleted heterojunction because you have a heterojunction, but it's depleted because the Ti2 is not doped. <laughs> so that's, it's, uh, it's a little bit odd to have these particles that can transport carriers. They're not doped. They might get, there might be some there might be some accidental doping by particles that, that make it into the films and get excited by light. So that we have to still, to, we have to check. And so here we get closer to our dream. We get an infrared response up to about 1,100 nanometers. And this is just a cross-section of those films with the TI2 and the whole conductor, the PBS, and that's the gold back contact. And uh, this is a uh, 17 milliamps current. I mean, this is our EQEs uh, up to th close to 30 percent. So it's quite, uh, quite interesting. And it's uh, very curious. It's an uh, interesting finding. We are pretty excited about it. So let's wrap it up. Stability. The, uh, we have this. Uh, this light soaking test has been done, a lot of work done industrially. Ionic liquids were important for the first industrial application. High temperature stability has also been shown now at 3,000 hours, 85 degrees. <coughs> but the standard, and the standard is to make the light soaking, the heat stress, Hot humidity, 85%, 85 degrees. And temperature cycling between minus 40 and 90 degrees. You have to do it 200 times. And as I mentioned to you, you have to take your cell through those three things. You can't just take one cell and do the temperature cycling, and the other you do the heat. <laughs> no. You have to go through this program whether you like it or not. And at the end, at the end, you have to show that the efficiency is within 5% what it was in the beginning. People don't care what happens in between. Rather, you want to take points in between of no interest. At the end, you have to show that you're within 5% of the initial value. And so this is the light soaking equipment. We can go up to 2.5 suns. It that cuts down on the time you need to bring the number of cycles up. The dye has to go through 100 million cycles in 20 years service time. So uh, you have to, in intense light, you get, of course, a shorten. So with our dyes, we, in 1,000 hours, we don't see a degradation. Now, what I have, you know, I'm traveling often, uh, and some of our younger friends you embark in photovoltaics. They would be tempted to say, <laughs> I've assisted in in presentations like the gentleman would say, well, you, my efficiency, if I extrapolate this, <laughs> I get 100 years lifetime. <laughs> so, so be very careful. <laughs> uh, that might be true. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so we're doing this 1,000 hour test. It's part of the scheme. And if you see a degradation, that's a real problem. So. Uh, if you don't, it just shows you 1,000 hours is about 11,000 hours outdoor. That's about uh, one and a half years uh, you're safe. Now, Fujikura is a Japanese company that has uh, been very uh, active in, in scaling up to modules. And so the highest module efficiency now achieved for dye sensitized cells is 8.6%. That's a module efficiency aperture 
area, total area efficiency. And how stable are we? This is now on an 8% module. Well, let's see 85. That's from Fujikoa. 85, 85. <laughs> You're doing uh, just well, OK? You're getting into troubles almost, but you're doing OK. I mean, if you take the beginning and the end, that's what matters. People are not interested in this little bump. Actually, you don't have to measure it. People will take your module, they do the 85, 85. After six weeks, they come back and they measure again. What's your, what's your stability at which level? So this one is very stable. This one also very stable, so that this Actually, this program shows can actually live through the whole test program with the Dyson style cell at the 8% level. That's a purge efficiency. But as I said, they actually, there's not a record efficiency at 8.6. And these are, you can check it in the tables that are being published by Keith Emery and Martin Green. So now, let's see where we. So Fujikura is developing these <coughs> modules, and this is a cable company. So why would Fujikura, as a cable company, make full cell modules? Well, I asked a question, and uh, I was there a week ago in Japan. And so the uh, managers told me, well, we, have, uh, we put our cables next to highways, and so we want to put those panels as sound barriers along the highways and uh, produce electric power. And the fact that you have this bifacial configuration, you're capturing light from all angles. Even if you mount vertically these cells, you get a lot of power out. Now, here's some of the color options. Beautiful colors. A very charming young lady. <laughs> Again, a charming young lady. So uh, uh, we have uh, this. Uh, this is a photovoltaic cell that Sony came up with. Now, this is also a Dyson size module from Sony this time. But they also do this these cells for inner applications. See the fan turning here? Well, at the end, that's not. You don't want to make a fan turn with those panels. Uh, what you want is to have a, a, a battery charge and a LED, LED, bring the light back. And that's actually done with those lamps here where you have the, the lamp housing as a photovoltaic cell. These are all Dyson sized cells. And I have to say, I was stunned by the beauty of this design. Right? I don't know how Sony, whom they employed, it must be an artist too who came up with these nice structures. But it's a functional structure. And what I think is we will see more and more photovoltaics be uh, implemented in our living space, where we use freely available light power to, to save energy, uh, have less consumption driving computers and uh, driving uh, our lighting system by uh, photovoltaic devices that uh, will power LEDs. That's why I'm so interested in LED program here. It's a way to save energy. And also, photovoltaics can profit, because LEDs run on much lower power consumption. So things like that are feasible because of the LED progress also, not only the PV progress. This is a telephone. Uh, Sony has also a telephone charger. And it's a solar charger. So but it's not only a solar charger. Who, who likes that design? In Switzerland, we vote. So, who likes it? Hands up. <laughs> who doesn't like it? <laughs> Nobody. Ah, good. <laughs> I mean, this is, you want to also sell. You, you want to go out and have this. This is, of course, the industry has to sell what they make. And so aesthetics are important. Now, who, who likes that? <laughs> <laughs> This is a, these are lamps that are, again, these are a LEDs, combination of a PV cell and a LED and a battery. So the LED is under the PV tile, it's transparent. And so during the day, the PV panel makes power. 
during the night, the light shines through the PV panel that is transparent and gives the light back. This is already a commercial product that you, can, you cannot buy it, but you can lease it in Japan. It's like the Prius. Japanese are very careful. <laughs> in the beginning, you couldn't buy a Prius. You had to lease the Prius. So. But this is their state-of-the-art panels. They can make this nice, this is now in Sears collected. Uh, from the Eisenseki Toyota Consortium. And you can get in green, blue, yellow, you name it, you just change the dye, you get different colors. So now integrated modules in the building. This is from uh, uh, 3G Solar, this Israeli company. If you have been in Jerusalem, you recognize those hills. These are big panels. They, uh, they, they are they're working very well. The Israelis have uh, done a very good job in, in uh, scaling up this technology. And so the full size is now a full size prototype. It's a three amps car. So this is power per molecule. Just think about it. This is not semiconductor driven. These are small fragile molecules giving you those, those 35 watt. Power three three volts and twenty, three amps and twenty volts. It's another module from Sharp. Well, this is now some of the first roof applications in Japan. Now, what kind of a roof is that? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, modest beginning, I would say, but very useful. <laughs> very useful. <laughs> and so. Uh, so, but uh, we have, we, I think a lot of the thin film, also OPV, we have an advantage because of uh, the silicon modules. There are several advantages. One is the angular dependence of efficiency is not as high as for silicon. If you look in the black curve, that's the silicon module. At 40 degrees, you're out of, you inclined 40 degrees with, re with respect to the solar incident you already get quite a penalty. And at 60, the penalty is 25 down. And so for, for the dye sensor, it's, it's, not, it's just not 5% down. So that means when the sun comes up in the morning, you are, unless you want to track the sunlight, you have always this problem of angular dependence. And so here, it's not unique to the dye sensor itself, but it's unique to some of the thin films uh, that, uh, uh, are being used. And also, the temperature dependence we have, and uh, we have a fairly flat level. So that can come down. Thin film doesn't, and all the Dyson size doesn't. Some flexible product from G24 Innovation. This is the uh, production in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Cardiff, some the first products being shipped now, this is the uh, first mass-produced products being shipped. This is the, f what, what I really like about uh, photovoltaic cells is the, the idea to use itself for car, car battery charging. I think it's bound to happen in the next couple of years. I will, for sure, I already have enough of those PV modules, the Dyson cells, to, to get the battery <laughs> power back once the next generation of, uh, of uh, electric cars, you can charge them yourself. And so the question is, how, can, how far can you get with one kilowatt watt hour? And so the Prius uh, can get about five miles. One kilowatt hour gets you five miles. And so, so you know, it's not so bad. To, if you think about city traffic, you could uh, have some solar, some solar charging during the parking period, you'll cover all your needs to go back and forth from, uh, from, from work. So this is, uh, this is actually uh, a real car that is uh, this time a golf caddy that is driven by those. This is from Korea, Dongjin uh, Semiconductors. It's building also uh, uh, Dyson sized panels. And so they have their own program showing that 
you know, for some of these applications, you actually can drive on the solar power. Because if you have a family car of five and you want to use a sun, forget it. It's not going to move your car forward. It's not enough surface area to do that. But for the golf caddy, yes. <laughs> you use all that surface, you see, you have to really stretch it to get that uh, collected. And so why not use the, the, this is a garage in the Toyota greenhouse. Why not use the panels to charge the batteries in the, uh, in the, the car batteries while it's in the garage? So that's, of course, that's something trivial. It will come, I'm sure. So I'm through, uh, Dan. So I'll just have a, I have a summary slide. We have, uh, uh, we have seen that uh, the, Reaching now 12, still is a way to go to make it to the 31% is the limiting efficiency of disensitized. So we are far away from that. And if you're interested, I can discuss with you in private or during discussion why, what's, what's missing. Uh, but tandems already have reached 16%. Right? I've showed you some of the recent stability, short energy payback. And finally, that uh, those uh, result from the flexible. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank, you Pleasure. thank you very much, Michael. Congratulations. For, and thanks for showing us the beginnings of the future. I know there must be questions. Well, um, to be honest, this particular kind of cell was published in uh, the Life of the And it used uh, a catalyte uh, as a body cell. Now, <coughs> we don't like that particular combination. It was a proof of principle to get a two, uh, it was a two terminal two terminal uh, tandem, so not four. It's not just using two cells, putting them on top of each other and pull, pulling power out of the two cells and adding the two power. Uh, that's <laughs> that wouldn't have been published by applied physics better. Okay. Now, it was a matched account matched system, and and it was uh, so it was two tandem integrated tandem with two terminals, and we got about over one volt voltage. And, and we matched about 12 milliamps current or a little bit higher. And, and that gave the 16% power conversion efficiency. So was that your question? <coughs> yes, good. Um, uh, can I ask, what kind of electrolyte uh, do you use uh, cell to this? Yeah, this is, uh, be honest. I don't know exactly what Fujikua used, but I can guess. Uh, they have been very actively pursuing the uh, ionic liquids. And so typically, these ionic liquids consist of an iodide salt that is a, is, may not be a liquid. That you can make it into a liquid by combining two iodide salts or eutectic mixtures. Today, a lot of systems are eutectic mixtures. And so we have the sometimes a triple component or tactic mixture with the iodide and some other anions. That's the base of it. But then they add nanoparticle silica to make it a solid. 5% is enough to turn the ionic liquid into a solid. And that solid is so solid that you can cut through with a knife. It's an amazing thing. So Fujikura has been pushing this. If you look at their history, but today, they won't tell you. I mean, even their best friends. <laughs> because that's a good, that's something they have as a, as a technology in their hands. They, they won't disc disclose that easily. So your titanium balls that you had before uh, what kind of voltage did you get on those? Early in your talk, you, you were quite pleased with These balls, they got me all excited, yeah, I know. Uh, so what the voltage was, yeah, it was uh, a little bit higher than what we get with the normal nanocrystalline films. The reason for that is that the, uh, 
uh, charge carrier recombination is slowed down because we can center those balls. We can go to 700 degrees, yeah. okay? So you get a better faceting of the nanoparticles. Practical. Yeah, Thank you center the balls first and then you make your device. What we are trying, what we're doing with the nanoparticles, we, we, we print the nanoparticles, then we have to center them. And so, isn't, so I, I'm glad you, you're telling me you like the idea of centering the balls and then put the balls on. Well, I'm <laughs> <laughs> I visualize that. Exactly. Yeah. I keep telling our friends from industry they should move to the balls, but you know, industry is slow. They will eventually do it. It's too, it's too exciting to be missed. So, uh, so, but we are, with the Australians, we are now making a thrust. We want to hit a new efficiency record with those balls. Right. <laughs> so, so that's uh, our goal. Very good. Thank you. Was there a limitation on those balls to the size? Because at the scale you had was 500 nanometers. I was like, Let's look at those balls one more time because they're so exciting. <laughs> 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 uh, so that we get all here. Here they are. So. so, what was the question? So, like, the scale's at 500 nanometers, but you said, I think you said later in the talk that it, the size needs to be. I'm making it 600, 700. So, yeah, they're probably. No, what I said was that individual <laughs> particles are about 20 to 30 nanometers, and the pores yeah. are about 25 nanometer size. That's the pore size. It's fairly narrow distribution of the pore. And I'm amazed how simple the, uh, if you look into the paper that Rachel Caruso published, just a Jack paper out now again on those balls. If you look into the literature, they, they are firing off papers like crazy because they want to get it all covered. <laughs> and so. Is it <laughs> Yes. And so the, 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 uh, the BET isosomes are there. It's all in the literature. It's in this paper, you, you see the, the advanced materials paper, you see the BET analysis and everything. But not, yes, and the first PV results. Of, of course, when we got those balls, we got more P, uh, PV power out. They got 7%, and we get 11 now. So, so they had a little advantage too. too. <laughs> to uh, collaborate with their friends from Switzerland. But... <laughs> there are some, uh, probably other uh, uh, material that have higher mobility, like zinc oxide. Can you comment on that instead of the um, Yes, uh, zinc oxide is uh, actually Fred Lange, who's from here, from Santa Barbara. He told me he can make both like that from zinc oxide. I don't know exactly how he does it. I, don't, I hope I didn't betray a secret here. But he told me that in private. And uh, he didn't say keep it as a secret. So I, I can talk to you about it. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so, 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 so Fred can do it with zinc oxide. And so what's wrong with zinc oxide? Well, zinc oxide has a lot of advantages, as you say. But only disadvantage of zinc oxide is that it's a as a material, it, it dissolves easily. And uh, lattice energy is, is low. Uh, and so what you want to do, actually, I think the winning concept is to use zinc oxide and put a shell of Ti2 on the surface to make sure that you don't get a stability issue. The conduction is much faster in zinc oxide than in Ti2. And then you can make the cell much thicker, I guess. Yes, but why would so you why would you do that? Because the rate probably would be affected for the. Yeah, you can make it thicker. Yes, and uh, but the dyes we have, I mean, uh, you're right that in some ways it would capture more of the tailing, so that's fine. I would buy you more current, and and not uh, you wouldn't pay in voltage for it. It's, a, it's correct. So thank you for your suggestion. Thank you. Okay, let's take two more questions. Three more questions, please. Uh, 
<laughs> it's got 14 terawatt to cover. So why do you want to take over anything? I think we have to, the problem is not that somebody eats the other. The problem is we don't have enough right. technology to meet the demand. And so uh, everybody has, I, I don't think it's time to remove the silicon from the PV market. It's not going to happen that fast. And so, uh, so as we, for example, where is the commercialization happening at ISENS test? In the building facades, in the walls on the, auto, uh, on the highways, you see, you see that now as an application. I have shown you the flexible. So we are strong in certain areas where the others, there's no other technology that can deliver translucent windows that make power. So why don't we focus on that application? I come from a different league yeah. than yours. You said the technology must be must have low environmental impact. What do you mean by that? Do you think that these particles will enter the environment eventually? Well, I, what I mean is that once you have a, a technology, when you make of the films already, you don't want to have a lot of pollutants created. One, one issue is how much is your CO2 footprint when you make a cell? How much CO2 is, is, is generated by generating those photovoltaic cells? And so when you go through the life cycle analysis, and this has been done by, for our cells by the Israeli group that is in our consortium from 3G Solar. I can give you the reference for that. And so, uh, you see that the footprint is much lower, the carbon footprint. And so you want to use technologies that uh, is environmentally friendly. What's going, what's going to do with one terawatt of cat telluride? You, first of all, you can't do one terawatt of cat telluride. But suppose you could. So what are you going to do with those cat telluride panels at the end? So you would have, first solar has to recycle. They promise, they promise. What if first solar has gone bust by that time and the life cycle is? So who takes those panels back? Our children, they will get uh, that in the, the problems. The next generation has to come up <laughs> with a solution and pay for it. Here's your problem. There's no, these, these are mesostructured materials. There are no nanoparticles floating around in the air when you handle those. Very stable. I'm interested to, um, to know more about the, um, the structure, the, um, the interconnection between the particles. Um, yes, about the high resolution, the, um, what type of overlap between the, the single particles when they interconnect? What yeah, the, uh, the, the single particle are the, uh, these are the zones where you create defect states. If you take one nanoparticle, the number of defects is about one per particle. We have measured that with EPR. Electron traps is about, with defects, I mean electronic traps for electrons. It's about one electron trap per particle. That's not much, okay? But once you put them in, in touch, you create a lot of, disorder and, uh, and the junction is not perfect, lead is not matched. So uh, that creates defect states. And so, uh, so what we wanted to know for me, how these defects look, or, well, I can only tell you that they have an exponential distribution. I, can, uh, I, 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 I could tell you about the, the, the DOS, the density of states that are generated. And uh, that's in the literature again. But it's true that when you do a higher sintering, that you get less of those states, and the transport is mainly affected by those states. And the worst is zinc oxide. If you take zinc oxide nanoparticles, and there seems to be some kind of a barrier generate when you make the particle-to-particle contact. The TI2 doesn't do that, but uh, with zinc oxide, you can dope those to very high level. They still are not conductive as a film. 
And so that's amazing. So why? Well, because of exactly what you're saying. So with zinc oxide, you like to have some nano rods or something that has a continuous structure or well-connected structure. And the other, do they have to connect along a certain phase, uh, preferential phases? Or? Well, I showed you that the prevailing phase is a 101 with the anatase. And, and 001, that's what you get. It's probably where how the contacting happens. Before we let you go, we want to give you this little souvenir from the Center for Energy Efficient Materials and from the Institute for Collaborative Biotechnology and from all your friends and admirers here at UCSB. Thank you, Dan. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's nice. Gosh, I didn't know you had this surprise for me. Very nice. Really <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You're great. Great such job. Terrific Thank work. Thank you. Very Thank entertaining you. And, and, and exciting. Very it wasn't special. very deep scientifically, no, but no, 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 no. Well, no, it was actually. Well,